Work, public work, September 14th. Um, first order of business are the. No, apparently not. First order of business are the a, a discussion of fee reductions for landfill permits for vehicles owned by uh, people with handicap placards or also people, uh, elderly people. Um, Councilor Labarge, maybe would you like to yes. lead the um, I want to thank the board for placing us on the agenda early. Um, I have received several complaints from residents on my ward about the handicap placards and also um, the disability plates. We did have a meeting with Karen, Ruth, I, and also Pat Shaughnessy, who's the director of the Senior Center, in regards to concerns of the language that has been placed on this ordinance. Um, we do have a meeting with Ned Huntley coming up next week in regards to some questions of that meeting that was presented uh, as a counselor, which has really upset me, and um, we want to straighten this out. But my main concern is way back um, in 1994, when my son was a counselor, thank God for Diane, because she presented this to me, and she worked very hard with my son of placing this ordinance. On it, what we're asking is, way back, and Karen, when was the date on that? 19, what was the date when you changed the language? 2004. 2004, okay. Anyways, this was eliminated and we're asking to please place this back on, which would be, um, however, that the fee for each permit for persons to whom the Registry of Motor Vehicles has issued a handicapped motor vehicle license plate or placard, which is valid at the time of purchase of the permit. Now, the reasons for that is you might have somebody who is 18 years old, and I do have that on my board, and you look back as the proposed pay-as-you-throw bag system, which needs base discount, I really have a problem, and so does the director of the senior center, on the language on this. I really feel, no matter if you have a handicap plate or a disabled placard, whatever, okay, you should be treated equally. Not be a group, but be treated equally. If you're 18 years old and you want to go into that landfill, you have that placard or that handicap. Okay, that is submitted by your doctor. Your doctor is the only one who says what your disability is. That is then sent to the Registry of Motor Vehicles who gives you that permit or that plight. Okay, I'm not happy hearing that some people are actually being asked by an employee, what is their disability? That's a no-no. That's a no-no, okay? That's way off. Mm -hmm. You don't ask that. What I'm asking is, if they're 18, 19, 20, or whatever, let them come in if they have that placard, if they have that plate, and they are treated by the motor vehicle registration of having that purpose and having that plight and be treated like if it's five dollars discount just like our, our seniors then that's what should be done they shouldn't have to be asked what their disability is when it could be something inside a person and not on the outside so that's why we're here today and patty will also talk because i'm on the committee on disabilities also throughout the city and i really have concerns of what's occurring here and that just to, to uh, if you would, speak for a moment about what the policy is. Well, the policy we have now is uh, seniors over 62 years of age receive a $5 permit. Everyone else pays for a $25 permit. So they get a $20 discount. That's correct. And so how about people with a handicap plate or a placard? Currently, uh, there's no difference between a regular citizen and one with a placard. So it's $25. That was changed with the ordinance changes in 2004 when the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund moved from the Health Department to the Board of Public Works. 
there were a number of ordinances that changed in regards to that they gave the control to the Board of Public Works rather than the um, Board of Health. Mm -hmm. So those changes, this was deleted as part of it and approved by the City Council. So, so people with a disability or, or a handicap plate or a placard, I, I'm, I'm just One circling time. back to your thought that some people were being asked exactly what is your disability when you felt that wasn't appropriate, but they, that is, uh, they, they it wouldn't be placard. coming up. We don't make a decision why they have a placard. Some other authority has done that. But the fact that they have a placard is what they're looking to be recognized for. What I don't know, um, are placards giving out on a yearly basis? Are they reviewed twice a year? Are they re reviewed every five years to see if that uh, person still has that potential handicap? I don't know those answers. How long these placards are good for? But I thought that the placard didn't make any difference. And the only exception right now is seniors over 62 receive a discount. It doesn't matter if there's a placard or not. That's correct. So what's the relevance? Karen, is it May 65 or 62? It's 62. 62. But I did want to say we do have a, a policy through the uh, Council on Aging for people who are elderly or disabled um, or handicapped can get a, the $5 permit. If, if they need assistance. So, you know, a caregiver or a family member can get this discounted permit. That is a placard so that it can be used in any car. So, and that's done through okay. the Council on okay. Aging. So there are situations where someone, like a placard, would yes. be displayed and... And, and so non-residents can get those if they're helping, a, you know, a handicapped or disabled or, so or elderly different car. resident from Northampton, yes. So we do have that discount in place. Uh, I was just wondering, how do they get that placard? Do they write a letter to somebody, or? Uh, they apply through the Council on Aging, and, and Patty actually makes oh, the, those the, determinations. No, the placard is from the registry. My wife had No, a I mean, we're talking about the, the, okay. the handicap um, elderly placard through the oh, council on aging. Awesome. Mm -hmm. There's an application that, that's online and also through the... Right, just want to make it clear, the placard gives the right for a close family member or a caregiver to have that reduced, reduced permit to take this elderly person's trash for them and bring it here. So they have this reduced fee for that placard to help out this elderly person. It's not based on the disability, it's based on age. Well, or handicapped. Is it, is it disability? Is it disability? disability right. But it's over 62? No. No? No. That's where the problem is. If it's an elderly person, it's 62. Here, here's a copy of what Northampton does for a placard to use the landfill or the recycling center. So, here. So, what you're saying is that there's a discount for seniors over 62 or for people that have placards. That have Any, this according from placards from the Council on Aging. Yes. Not from the registry, not from anybody. That's just true. the Council on Aging or seniors over 62. Yes. Okay. So now I'm confused with the issues. And it's this. Sorry, go ahead. What's your name? I'm Diane Lake. I'm the one that started this commotion by getting this petition going back in 94, was it? Mm -hmm. And I, it went through. Um, I'm disabled. I may not look into you, but my doctor and Social Security, everybody else says I am. Okay? Um, I have a placard because I cannot afford to buy the plate. They charge you extra for the plate. The placard I can take wherever I go. Mm -hmm. Um, I which placard? It's the one that hangs from your mirror. mirror. You've got the. I got one vehicle. of those. Right. Motor vehicle placard. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, it's. I am disabled. I'm on Social Security disability. I am in a fixed income level, the same as a senior citizen. And uh, you also have a placard. One of these placards. The. No, I'm not qualified to get that because I'm not 62 or over. But I'm on a fixed income. I own property here in the city. I have my own house. I have expenses like everybody else. But I'm on a uh, fixed income. This is why I went after this before. Because people that are disabled 
on Social Security, we are on a fixed income just like senior citizens. And I would like to be able to get the discount, which was approved of before, back. I think that it's not fair that you have to put an age limit on or over 70 to get a discount, improve your income, or any of that for, for you know, I just feel like I'm being, yeah, it says, for persons so, uh, uh, from the, for whom the Registry of Motor Vehicles has issued a handicapped motor vehicle license plate or placard, which is valid at the time of the purchase, you have to go and have your doctor sign papers and send it to the registry. No layman is involved. There's a doctor that has to okay this, and it's reviewed, at, I believe it's up to five years now, every five years. Mine is chronic. I'm not getting any better. If you, they used to have in the city, if you had a problem for six weeks, you could get a little thing at City Hall. I don't know if you still have that, but that's not a placard. This is from the registry. You have to meet their criteria. Right. And I do. And, and a lot of people do. And when you, I don't look at, and I go up and I ask about this, and they say, you're disabled? Yeah, I'm disabled. That's why I've got the placard. And I would like this reinstated. I don't think I'm asking too much. Right, thank you. Jim? Uh, is there a disability waiver that comes with income? Uh, is there a, um, that, that people who, who have a low income are, are able to write a letter from the assessors? I scan yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. it's the yeah. access there is. It's the 41C through the assessor's right. office. But through the assessors, you can get various exemptions if you're disabled or you're a senior. Right. And there's also CPA exemptions. But, but oh, thus far, with good. the registry motor vehicle to get a handicap placard or plate, or the placard that I'm going to call the DPW placard, there's no income eligibility. If but you can have a handicap placard and be making $100,000 a year. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but the point of either getting a placard, a DPW placard, and I think after all this we should change the DPW title of what we have, mm -hmm. not to be a placard because I think that's yeah. confusing, um, with the register a motor vehicle placard. Um, that you know, there's a difference between the two, and um, I think it was Karen that I started doing the placard with um, with her, the DBW placard, and it was um, my understanding at that point that a per in the I, I sent around the application that we used that that was um, developed, and again, this was before my time when that placard, the DPW placard, was established that it was designed for those people 62 or older or who are disabled who needed to have their trash brought to either the landfill or the recycling to be um, disposed of and it could it was for a caregiver from another community that was the only way dpw was allowing someone from another community to use our landfill to get rid of trash I remember I the discussion know. at the time, the idea was if your children were visiting from Boston, you could give them the trash on this placard and they could bring it or right. you know, get it or wherever. Yeah. And so that's typically how it's been done all along. And I was trying to think, did I start helping uh, or working with the DPW with this DPW placard and with Karen like in 2003 or 2005? And there are a lot of people who use it. It could be anywhere between 35 and maybe 50 that may go out in a year, and it does provide a great service for people who are unable, you know, I say people, I mean 62 and older and disabled who cannot bring their own um, trash. Unfortunately, the problem with that is that the daughter, um, you know, isn't uh, in another community or their neighbor helps them out every once in a while, but that person's not from another community. So they don't really qualify this for this DPW placard. I mean, I understand the logic to why the placard for DPW began, but I think that it really needs to get reviewed as well and be changed. And with a conversation uh, in a meeting that um, Mary Ann Ruth and, and Karen and I were at, 
it was to refine that it isn't necessarily a caregiver from another community because it was really limiting those people. Um, so with what I just said there, I would also, being the director for the Council on Aging, and also I'm the ADA coordinator for the city, that you might want to look at it not being age 62. I don't know where that age came from, but anything that we do through the city for the Council on Aging, the, the age is 60, not 62. That's how you qualify in Northampton to use the services of the Council on Aging, and that's how we get reimbursed from the state uh, through a, a grant that we, that's like one of our biggest grants that we get. So that, that's just another consideration in all of that. And getting back to Jim, what you had said, Jim, um, somebody that's 65 could be working and making, at 65 you can still work. You could be making a lot of money and be disabled too. Yeah, you could that's be what seven, I'm but I'm just saying the theory behind this in the beginning wasn't it for seniors that are on a fixed income? Yeah, that's why I was. Excuse me, if I may. That's why I was um, asking about the the uh, eligibility for um, a discount on one's taxes and right. so on. I mean, those people would automatically qualify, mm -hmm. and 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 if they had a handicap placard. That could qualify them, but there there is um, a lot of study that's got to go into this uh, because uh, I certainly don't feel as though I'm eligible for um, any kind of discount on my um, my um, uh, trash disposal. Um, I you know I I um, it, I just. Don't see it. I th the yeah. big difference is income eligibility. Then. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That'd be fine. Yeah. Same income eligibility on seniors. Could you identify yeah. yourself? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, Dave. My point exactly. My name is David Reed. I'm from Northampton Media. And uh, well, the chairman and Ned have asked some of the people that they don't know to identify themselves for the purpose of the video or for reporters or for the record here. I think it's important also to. People like Patty and Karen, and you know who they are. It's just at least the first time they're talking, just to introduce themselves, and that's all I'm asking. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I apologize. My name is Ruth McGrath. Uh, my point is that if you want to set a limit on income for the disabled, you also have to set that same limit for senior citizens. It's got to be the same across the board. Thank you. Karen? Um, I did some research of municipalities throughout the Commonwealth through the municipal recycling or municipal assistance coordinators those those are DEP um, so they represent all the communities and what I found was that there are a lot of communities that give a senior discount it's very common that on the, on the vehicle permits not necessarily on bags or tags or other disposal costs and um, I didn't find any that had a discount that were as generous as as Northampton's Five versus twenty-five dollars. It's more apt to be like a, you know, a ten, twenty percent kind of discount. And the other thing I found was that there wasn't any other municipality that had um, an age threshold less than sixty-five. So, so sixty-five is the standard out there. And I also didn't find any municipalities that had um, any other discounts for, um, you know, veterans or handicapped people or or any other, um, you know, group that has challenges. There, there are many communities that use the, um, the 41C um, clause, you know, if you qualify for property tax or CPA exemptions, then they do have discount programs. And I've got... Um, six communities and they sent me their applications and all of that so I know what and that that doesn't really add any administration to the because the assessors keeps that list up to date so either you're on the list or not but that's definitely income based and it's somewhat I, neutral um, I, uh, after the solid waste um, task force I think there was some one of their recommendations was that there would be a needs-based um, uh, uh, 
alloca uh, allocation or, or discount. Promote, discount, yeah. And so we, you, I remember that you've done the research on that. Is that still, um, we haven't acted on that. Is that correct? Right. Um, we were talking about that in April, mm -hmm. and you asked me to go back and do some more research, mm -hmm. which I did. Which and was the 41C pretty mm -hmm. much was that. Okay, I'm just checking because yeah. I'm like, I don't and, and also to see what other municipalities were doing mm -hmm. and, you know, if there were other mechanisms. And I think at, at the time our concern was needs-based as opposed to age or any other um, mm -hmm. uh, category that there might be. Yeah, and it, it really was, um, the needs-based was connected with the pay-as-you-throw bag program mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. not just the vehicle permits. Yeah, so. right, right. So, so we haven't acted on that, but we have done the research and, and that it will be something that we'll be considering in the future. Okay. So I would say Jim is quite right. This, this clearly does. I don't think I don't see any way to make it some kind of a decision this evening. This clearly. We need to think about this a little bit, I, so I, we can put together a comprehensive policy that and be consistent. Yeah. yeah. So we need a subcommittee. Okay. <laughs> okay. We need a task force. Um, uh, Karen has been working on this, right? Right. Well, that's why I went her. And, uh, oh. I mean, we just, just need to reopen discussion. All we yeah. need to do is pull it together and take a look at it, yeah. get some suggestions from Patty. Patty is the, is, is the uh, director in the area. The and, and, and let's let's pull something together and see what we have. Mm -hmm. I wasn't asking for a discount on the trash that no, I No, no, I understand. Like. But I was just going by my income versus mm -hmm. yeah. seniors to start off on the same playing field. Sure. If everybody creates their own amount of trash, yeah. they should be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. I try to recycle and do everything I can. And I, all I'm asking is to be met a little bit with my income at, along with the rest of the people in my situation. Well, evidently, we have already started this. We just haven't completed it. I just, yeah. I, I guess I'm kind yeah. of backwards or something. Why was the language in the first place changed uh, when it was already there? That was quite a while ago. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I did yeah. this back in 94, and then all of a sudden I was told no. Not that I wasn't here in 94. Well, I know you were. <laughs> Council of Arts. Yes, um, we have a committee on disabilities next week, so we will bring this up, we will talk about it, and get the feelings from the committee members on it. Because I know it's huge. Well, we'd appreciate your input. Income, Gene Tacey, Ward 7, City Council. And Ruth McGrath's point and Jim Dawson's point are well taken for me. I work for several people in the city that have handicap placards on their car, and they are over 62 years old. But they're able to generate some in the millions of dollars a year in revenue. So, and I don't believe that they should be eligible for a discounted sticker on their car. I agree. So I just, but those points are well taken with it, and thank you. Um, so just in closing with my remarks, um, if you do a task force, that, that is great, and I would love to serve on that. Um, I just wanted to add that um, with Ned's assistant, and the assistance and this happened a couple of years ago, that you did put in a handicap spot out here for people to dispose of their trash. That was a great thing to do. And I'm just going to pass along that the comments I get from both the elderly and the disabled that your um, folks who work at helping take the trash from their vehicles, um, they can't say enough good things that people are very uh, helpful and they provide a lot of assistance, which is very important. That's our concierge service. service. <laughs> Do they wash and wax my car too? I wish they would. I'd be in the uh, There is one problem out there, and I have some pictures on my cell phone if you'd like to see it. Um, people tend to drive up. The cars park along here. Handicap spot is on the end. People come up, especially when it's busy, like on the weekends. You can't see that spot. You don't know what's going on. So they drive up behind it, discover it's blocked. They can't back up. This line is busy. <laughs> the cars line up down along there. And they can't pull out. And these cars pull out. And pretty soon you've got a mishmash of all these cars going every which way. 
traffic um, jam. Yeah, and I've taken some pictures of that just because I happened to get stuck in it. I didn't know the handicap spot was full. Drove up, discovered I couldn't get into it, and you can't back up, and pretty soon cars are lined up behind you. You know, it's it's inevitable. I mean, it just happens. Um, but then I do have, like I said, some pictures. I don't know the solution. We walked out, Patty and, and Councilor Barge and myself, and talked to the people out there, and they didn't have any suggestions either. It's just one of those things that I don't know what the solution would be. Right, thanks. Uh, Gary? I don't need to see your pictures. I'm well aware of the what happens, <laughs> and, and I have, uh, through enforcement, been asked to move my car. So I think it's just the, uh, the gatekeepers keep an eye on it. So I, mm -hmm. I've been told I couldn't park there. I wasn't intending to park there, but I figured I can't move, so I started unloading my trash. And yeah, what do you do when there's cars in front of you, cars behind you? And mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I moved as soon as I could. Yeah. And Karen, is that the last um, word? Yes, we're closing the emergency. I think we have the, the opportunity with this policy that, through the Council on Aging to just change that so that it really works um, rather than trying to go through City Council with an ordinance change. I'm sorry. Um, so I think, you know, a, a, a working group can can certainly and, come up with uh, a, a good solution, I think. What's a reasonable time frame, do you think, to put together a recommendation? Um, if you're meeting next week, right. um, we could have October? some kind of, well, we could have some kind of proposal by the next meeting, the 28th, I would think. It's, Check meeting meeting schedules. That's yeah, quick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. or sometime early October meeting. Well, the last time we talked about it, one of our concerns was we, we wanted a sense for how many people would be eligible for the discount if we changed the policy. Yes. And and that I don't know if we have that yet, but that may take some time to pull together. Well, the 41C is we're talking about hundreds. Of that's a different. Yeah. yeah. Right. That, you know, that's so an automatic yeah. list. Um, mm -hmm. um, Bar. I have to agree with what I just heard. I don't think we should rush this. Yeah. I think the committee should be formed, and we need to look at that language very carefully and put it in place the right way. You move quickly, it's wrong. Yeah. The other final issue on this is that we've done a significant number of our permit sales at this point. And all of a sudden, I mean, those sales started on July 1st. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much, I think, caught most of the residents at this point. So it looks like this might be a stepping start for next year when we start selling permits in FY12. Mm -hmm. Just so you're aware of that. So we have plenty of time to get this right. Mrs. Hodges. Ms. Hodges. Um, Mrs. Hodges. Mike, I just want to make a comment that not everyone who and gets your name? Uh, Mimi Hodges. <laughs> David Reed. Um, I was just going to make the comment that maybe perhaps not everyone who is on that designation that she says even uses the landfill. Some people may actually have have worked something out through a private hall or two. Or, up, or so. they're in yeah. yeah, or Section 8 kind of housing. Or. Yes. And, and just to add to that, not everybody on that list, I mean, there are many people who are elderly or uh, disabled who do not own homes. So they're not even included at that uh, point. So oh, right. it would be very, um, mm -hmm. it, it would exclude a number of people. But we don't even know how many that would really be. Mm -hmm. But don't, don't renters, don't the landlords usually take care of trash disposal? No. <coughs> yes, I also would like to be considered to be on the committee with Patty because being the liaison for the city. So Karen, are you going to put together a, a group of people who can work on this? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, is the board comfortable with letting her put that together? Yeah. And Dave. Oh well, uh, some some of my thunder was stolen. Dave Reed from my thank you. Uh, not only is it people who might qualify if you go that way for d disabilities or elderly, but also income. I found myself in a position where I'm pretty poor. And I don't own a home, I'm not on a list, I'm not on <laughs> so, uh So I don't even know how you find these people or how, what process you're going to use, but take your time. You still have trash, though, don't you, Dave? Uh, you know. 
No trash. No. <laughs> he put right. it in yours. <laughs> so Karen's going to work on putting together a group. Uh, I think we agree that this could be a matter of a couple of months. Get it right. Figure it out. Uh, thank you all for coming in. Thank you very much. Okay. No. Um, okay, number two is a discussion about uh, drainage on center court and the games are here. It's kind of behind the old Elks building, the private way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sign for the committee. The private way committee? Yeah. Where is the <laughs> and Lily, you need those. Those boots are like it's a, a, a I have my props. <laughs> um, I'm Lily Gabe. This is my husband, Bennett Gabe. The two of us own um, two properties in the uh, mysterious and charming but secluded center court. And uh, Michelle Kasky and Richard Trousdale well, that's are I'm representing the our so tenants. And we're representing the uh, informally neighborhood association. So yeah, where's Center Court? The people who grew up here don't know. I can show you the map. Uh, probably wouldn't help. But it used to be called um, Center Street Avenue. Does that help anyone? <laughs> Well, I always know it is Center Court. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you go down Masonic Street, past Woodstar, and you cross Center Street, you go right into the driveway of Center Court, and it says Dead End Private Way. When uh, we bought the first of our buildings about 17 years ago, I asked the city if they would put up a sign that said Dead End because people thought they could cut through to King Street <laughs> and they'd get all bollocked up. So that helped a lot. Um, my prop is because I'm here mainly to address the um, lack of drainage in Central Court, which has reached tremendous proportions. So that I always carry these with me. And <laughs> a ruler and a marker um, truly, uh, I'm serious. I do. I keep these in my car. Uh, and I wish that I had a bunch of them to uh, hand out to people. You know, they could be sort of stationed like a rent bike before you enter the court because um, it's, it's a public safety hazard to try to negotiate when there's heavy rain, when there's snow, when there's ice. A week after everything's dried up and everything is sunny and bright, center court still is half covered by cool water. There's no drainage. It's a very narrow street. It's central business. You know, it was a farm that found itself in central business, and that's what it is very legitimately. Um, there's five buildings in the court and two more that are abutters and there are about a hundred pedestrians that use the street every day and I've calculated that because I know how many tenants I have, most of them are in the healing professions so I know, you know they have to work about six hours a day and um, then they include themselves so you know, that would be twelve of them um, and each of them seeing, say, an average of six clients a day. Then there's law offices, and you know, I know they see people in their offices and they also go out. So, you know, another, you know, half dozen, dozen. Then there's probably uh, at least a dozen uh, residents who live back there. It's lovely. We've created patios. There's grass, trees. Um, it's a real gem, but some of the facets have flaws. I mean, we pay central business taxes, we generate income for you know, 
ourselves and our therapists. Um, they're wonderful resources back there, but we can't manage um, with the lack of drainage. It, it just so there's no me, storm drain. You no, know, makes me shudder right to see um, people trying to negotiate, especially elders or someone with a walker. There's you know someone who provides physical therapy, rehab services. There's doctors back there. Um, is that true, Lily? There's no storm drain back there? There's, no, there's no storm drain. And, you know, everybody takes care of their part, and then it's here and this, with, with the city comes down center, someone usually calls, or uh, most of the time I just say the heck with it to my plow guy, and I say, if it's not plowed, plow it. And so I, I end up just... should also mention that... 19 center court is handicapped accessible, but people can't even right. make well, it. There's a huge irony yeah. that, that came about a few years ago um, through uh, an averted tragedy. The, the back building was hit uh, by lightning. We had a fire, so you might be familiar with that. And no one was hurt, fortunately, no other buildings were damaged. Had the opportunity to rehab it and um, make it. Accessible. So here's this Victorian house that has a ramp and wide and, uh, you know, aisles and doorways and two rooms designated specifically for accessible use and more bathrooms than you can <coughs> imagine needing in a day. I mean, it's great. I'm so proud of it. But it's, it's, they, you can't get to it. So give me a second and let's, let's uh, let Ned talk a little bit yeah. about the logistics of... Uh... Well, there's two things going on out there. Number one, it's a private way, so we're not allowed for reimbursement from Chapter 90 for drainage or roadway improvement work, per se. We'll go in there and fix occasional potholes. We still plow the private way, like we do a number of other private ways in the city still at this point. Um, also, as part of that, um, our budget was cut two years ago. The $62,000 a year we dedicated to drainage repairs or system upgrades uh, was zeroed out. So we have no money for future drainage projects also at this point, unless I use Chapter 90 funds, which private ways are not eligible. So kind of in a quandary is you can't put money for those things in the private way. We have one public utility in there. It's a four-inch water main. It's, so it do seems you, like they have, have a septic sewer that runs back? It's private sewer. Across. It's and private out, sewer. Out to Gothic. I believe that's where it goes. It seems like there would be some mechanism to take something that's so outdated and change it. You know, because basically it's a central business street that's orphaned right in the middle of lots of business that's functioning with mandates that sidewalks be plowed. You know, we don't have a sidewalk. Our narrow little street is our sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And um, the city plows it intermittently. It's, it's very, very inconsistent. And um, they're gracious when I call or somebody else calls. But it isn't regular. And it because there's no drainage and because it's inconsistently plowed, then we have ice skating rinks. And, you know, I'm, I feel that my ability, not just me, but my colleagues, the other businesses that operate here, um, we're really being undermined in our ability to conduct business if our tenants can't safely get to the building. And the biggest irony, of course, is the building. I went to great lengths to make it accessible. I think it should be adopted. And, all right, it, it, it's been a private way. Why does it have to stay a private way? This is something the city is working on. I just looked back at my phone. I met with the mayor uh, Thursday, September 1st, specifically about this this very issue. Uh, you see the mayor now? Is, is it Mayor no. Narkowitz? Mayor Narkowitz. Mayor Narkowitz was there, uh, former Mayor Higgins was there, uh, the staff of the DPW. I mean, we're wrestling with this issue. It, it doesn't lend itself to a simple solution. 
There is no money coming from the state or the federal government to help with this. Uh, there's certainly no appetite on the local level to, say, have a, a, prop, a Proposition 2 and a half override to uh, address uh, stormwater drainage issues or some, in some way raise more money for public works projects. Um, we're, we're, honestly, we're, we're struggling with this issue. Um, and, and it doesn't uh, lend itself to a simple solution. No, I was just going to say that I, I think for about a year we've been talking about some sort of effort on this, and I know mm. that there was longer, uh, well, much okay. longer. Yeah, it's a, but there, that it's finally. I mean, it feels like there's a regular stream of people who come in private ways, be it the plowing issue, drainage, you know, road repair. I, it feels like we need to ratchet it up in terms of a, you know, we're putting together a task force or a subcommittee to start tackling the issue and to identify the issues. I mean, they're they're. They just seem to be coming at us. And clearly, our resources are limited in terms of what's coming at us from the general fund. But, you know, look. I think of it as political. I mean, if somehow Amherst uh, found the political will to raise almost $5 million to repave a, a whole slew of roads around the center. If you've been over in Amherst recently, their roads are fabulous. Well, they came up, they found the political will to borrow almost $5 million for that. This is something that I don't know if we can solve it at this level. But uh, I was going to just go on to say that, you know, I think there's a process the, of, of, you know, we are the municipality and we've struggled with what is our role in trying to solve these problems. That there are, that they just seem to keep festering and is there a way for us to tackle this? I mean, I know there's betterments, opportunities to do betterments, you know, let, if we want that piece of, private way upgraded and brought up the standard and have a conversation with the abutters and say it can be done but there's some costs that might be assessed back to you. Is there a way we can start tackling this? Because it feels like it's a an endless stream of coming in, people coming in and complaining about this. And let's try to solve the ones that we so can where there's some neighborhood a agreement. Policy that would give us a, some procedure so we could say we will work to upgrade this this private way, but it means that before it can be accepted by the town that there might be a betterment that gets assessed among the people who would be served by those improvements. I, I, think our, I think our problem there is that there is no way, because of the size of that, to bring it up to standard. No, no. but it can, or you can put a drain in and tie it into the center street. No, we can't. We can't spend public money in there because no, it's, it's private property. But it's, it's, Doable. Oh, it's doable. Yes, yes. If if the neighborhood wanted to get together and build a a storm drain system and connect it into a municipal storm drain, I'm sure the city would let you. But that's an expensive proposition. Right. I've been yeah. trying to organize for yeah. 17 years the uh, other residents. Mm. And they feel that the uh, private way designation is out. Dated. And it may be. That's it needs to be cool. revisited yeah. because it's become, you know, very much uh, a representative of the downtown community. You know, it's a mixed use street, businesses and housing. Yeah, we understand that. Councilor Tacey. Yeah. <clears throat> Jean Tacey Ward. So I've actually researched it pretty well. I know the property well. I did uh, for the former owner about 20 three or four years ago to upgrade the road and it was cost prohibitive at the time and it required many very it required variances through uh, the zoning board and the planning department because the road was not wide enough and it was cost prohibitive to do it um, and I do this I develop properties constantly where drains and, and sewers are put into public utilities and there's always a fee and there's a it's complicated. The fees are involved, and then there's connection fees, and there's um, you have availability studies. Uh, it was for I think it was Floyd Andrus, wasn't it? Yeah, Floyd Andrus owned it, and um, that was a long time ago. Well, Floyd still owns that property. Oh, he does. Yeah. I didn't know he still owned it. I'm surprised he's not here. Yeah, hmm. but uh, I've we did, gotten I looked estimates. At it. I've yeah. gotten estimates every few years. Yeah. For the past 17 years, and yep. presented them and said, "Hey, you know, maybe we can 
maybe if we come to the city with these and say, maybe we can all work together. Um, most of the people are pretty adamant about you know, it being central business and uh, deserving the, the recognition that I is reflected guess. in the business that it generates. I just wanted to highlight, when you had your meeting with the former mayor and the current mayor, you probably addressed the fact that there was, what, 150 private ways? There's a long, long list. And so it's not it's not a unique situation. But are they all downtown central business? No, it's an oddball list. Uh, it, it's less than that. It turns out some have a cloudy designation as uh, city streets. Well, Others are city downright street. not yeah. city streets. Uh, but some, what I'm saying, it's not just a, it's yeah. not just a small amount. It's yeah. a, it's At a minimum, there are decision. dozens and dozens of streets in that same category. Of downtown central business. Of uh, being a private way that looks like it ought to or ought to be or could be a street. A yeah, Waga that, over by Smith College is not okay, too far but, outside but of but central business. But I'm talking business. about a downtown central business zone. Right in the middle of the little, of the little alleyway, downtown. this bank row, uh, and uh, uh, between Jigs and. Uh, yeah. So there's not that many. That are there are many, but we certainly have no special designation for central business private ways. Right. If we tackle this, it'll you know, be more global than simply center, central business, I imagine. Mm. Because I think it makes a difference in consideration. You know that the public is, you know using the facilities of the businesses with the expectation that they can get there safely, especially when they choose uh, an accessible uh, venue, you know, that's met all the codes on the back and forth, it's the architectural access boards and you know, plumbing and heating boards. And right. So it's, it's a huge irony. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Thanks. My question is, um, is the, the, the area, since it's businesses, most people then are like renting the space? Is that why there's the pushback to essentially make this investment? Because it's the, I mean, because a business owner may be in business for the next 10 years and then they're going to spend a lot of money. I'm, I'm just trying to find out who is, who have you been approaching to potentially make that investment? Are the people who the own, own the, the owners. The owners, so not necessarily to the people who are. Not the tenants. Okay. I was just curious about that. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Richard Trostel. I'm a psychotherapist and I rent uh, office space. And um, I, I did it on the understanding that my clients would be able to come to me. So, though it's a private way, it's for my clients, it's a public way. And it's very hazardous in the winter when the ice is there. And so, I just want to support what Lily's saying there that I, I rented because it was downtown, it was an office space in downtown North End, and that's why I came. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I bought the building. <coughs> yes. I'm Michelle Kasky. I'm also a tenant in um, in one of these buildings. And, and the nature of the puddle is really like it's a small lake, honestly. It's probably about 20 feet across and can get in the center of the puddle to be about five or six inches deep. And so when things dry up, it takes a really long time for that puddle, that little pond, to go away. And in the winter, it's solid ice. It's like an ice skating rink. And it's really scary. Thank you. I'm not sure where to go with this. Well, what's coming Ideas? Out of, uh, well, just what's, uh, what's coming out of the meeting that you have with the mayors and the mayors? <laughs> Every, t every time we get close to this issue, it, it's mind-boggling. Uh, what we're looking for is some clarity. Let's say we took it over. Let's say the city made a decision, a policy decision, that we're just going to absorb all of these private ways. Do we have to uh, have a comprehensive survey? And unfortunately, uh, the city attorney on the phone thought the answer is probably yes. It would not be sufficient to say, describe it. Like, the property shall include all of the paved areas plus an additional five feet, more or less, on all sides. That will not cut it in terms of creating a defined city street. Yeah, we to need take it over as a city street. And then we have easements. Yeah. All around the pavement. That's a Bob Reckman movie. Then we have easements. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
making a past chairman. I just found myself making a past chairman move. And then we have easements. Uh, there needs to be space around the uh, paved area or the city street that's uh, available to the city for maintenance work. Well, that means property taking. It might mean uh, eminent domain would be probably the simplest way to do it. It's just a, a hairball once you dig into this even a little bit. And every time we come close to it, we back away and say, well, we should think about this. Oh, yeah, it is a messy, messy problem. Well, you know, George Andrews and I went round and round you know, for years, and he'd see me coming and he'd turn his pockets inside out. Uh oh, here comes the yeah. pockets. But I think it's particularly challenging because we don't own the land. The city does not own the land. It's been designated as a private way, and so the ownership and the care and maintenance of that private way is nebulous. It's private. Yes. That's right. And that private entity, you can't find them. <laughs> So and and it's, 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 a fu it's fuzzy also, going back to the mayor's meeting, the, um, there's a court ruling in the eastern part of the state, and the state attorney general is telling us that if the municipality is going to plow uh, a private way such as yours, uh, henceforward the city council is going to have to have a special appropriation to designate money that will be used in the coming winter to plow private ways. The plan we're working on this year is to just do them all. But we need to really figure this out because henceforward the city council is going to have to explicitly uh, appropriate money to be expended on these private properties. It's, it's going to, I think, ramp up the uh, pressure to solve these problems. Could be a good thing to, to push the question a little bit, but in any event, we're being pushed by the state uh, attorney general to uh, handle this in a proper way. But but even if we did that, the only way to solve the problem that they have is with a betterment tax yeah. that would go back to the business owners to pay for the installation of the line and connection to the city sewer city drainage. And then they, I mean... That's the only way, because we haven't got the money. Right. But at least there's there's a way, there's a solution that's possible. It means people might have to ante up. Yeah. But at least it doesn't continue to be this visit that we get. How often do you come in and visit with the Board of Public Works? Every five years or so? Years or many. And it I doesn't think, get I, I think people, you know, I, I think I can speak for most of the property owners that they would be happy to come to a conversation, you know, because um, we're really desperately needing you know. to help. Councilor Tyson. Yeah, and I, I believe you might be, I can't speak for the entire council and I wouldn't even attempt it, but I think you would be hard pressed to find the city council approving spending money that we don't have and actually putting more of a burden. Uh, we know that the DPW is spread so thin now um, and their funding is well, I won't even get into it, but um, and I'm on the conference committee, I'm pretty familiar with um, what they're doing, and they are stretched, and there really is no money. When I say zero money, we were starting out our fiscal year this year with $200 in free cash for a $97 million budget. That was our first projection, and then we found 10000 so it's... The most yeah, wonderful it's, society, we're it's under, very difficult. Underfunding our government. It's happening on the local level, it's clearly happening on the state and federal levels, but it's really clearly happening on the local level. Um, it's just no it's appetite so to pay for this stuff. If I may, yeah. our deficit spending this year was absolutely enormous for snow that we had to make up also. Um, so even the snow plowing aspect of the private ways, it's more of a burden than you can even imagine. Does it make sense for us to have, I don't know if policy is quite the right word, but going back to what you were saying, MJ, does it make sense for us to have something on our side that could be part of the conversation, the conversation that you allude to, um, just a set of guidelines about what would be acceptable for this, from the city's point of view or what we would encourage people to consider in a case like this? Is acceptance of the public way? 
Well, well, that's a, a separate conversation, but at least, for example, let's say they decided to put in a, a storm drain in the center of the lake. Um, do we have a part in that conversation? Do we have a role to play? We have an entry permit that would allow them to do it, and we would approve that entry based on capacity of the system, which shouldn't be an issue. And then maybe they would need to have a land use attorney to help them form a betterment association for allocating their fees equally among the groups. So that could be part so of. So that could be part of like some solutions. I mean, like a little package. I'm just wondering if we could at least have a little bit of that, a little bit of that, something, so that there's some process for private ways to. Right, most most benefit. Most betterments are on public ways to deal with utilities in a public way, not a private way. The last betterment that we did was putting in the pump station at um, Coach Light Apartment or Coach Light Condominiums on Merrick Street. And then the, that street up by the State Police Barracks where we did the uh, sewer extension. Marion, Marion yeah. Street. And that was a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't happen too often. East Hampton just did betterments in, in their community for extension of sewer lines uh, into the Plains area of the city. So, But they're all in public ways, not on private ways. So what do you think about that question? Of, is there any... So you don't see a role that we could play to at least jumpstart the conversation? Well, I guess, I guess the question of role is, is that uh, a number of years ago, when I first joined the department in 2000, 2001, we actually did work in private ways. Warner Row, King Avenue, we installed all new sewer, water drains, and pavement. There was no betterment fees. I don't recall the funding sources back then. I'm sure there was a mixture of water sewer enterprise funds and some general funds on that. Mm -hmm. Why we did that, I couldn't tell you. Or how we did it. And I wanted to know why not us. I don't have an answer for that. We didn't pick you. The uh, that director is long gone, and I don't remember. I was on the board at the time. I don't recall any specific. And you were. I was working for the department then. Yeah. What a row. But if a group of property owners come together who are abutting a private way and want to make improvements, not necessarily upgraded all the way to city street standard, what's the process for them to be able to do that? I think they have to visit with the land use attorney. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Because the other, the other, I mean, unless we decide that as a city we want to resolve them all, and, and like you said, that's a long, complicated process, but it doesn't take care of the immediate concerns that people have about drainage or things that might need a little improvement, they're just looking for a way to have some common action to make it better. Sure, they'd like the city to pay for that, but I don't see that we should be, yeah. given that it's a private way, or that we have the resources to do that. But if we can help create the conversation so there's an opportunity for people to find a way to start solving that as we work on the private way, then I think that would be helpful. It would. We really don't know, you know where, where to go. I mean, I... And then turns his pocket down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just really quickly, um, I remember there was a whole a bunch of auto in Harold's garage, and there's a huge trunk line Jim would know about that goes down through Harold's garage parking lot. And when they had a lake built out there and they couldn't access the back of the building, they actually paid to have a storm drain, a catch basin put in and piped into, and it was a fee assessed to pipe into the <clears throat> the short, the shortest solution, but it's, it cost money is to actually install a drain on your private property and run it to the city street. Right. Um, other than that, I don't know how, I, I don't know, I don't know where there's any funding. I don't know where there's any money that you'll find. But the, the where it's the worst isn't my property. It belongs to one of the other people who own property there. I well, thought it was on the private way. It is. So. So who owns that? Well, everybody owns some of the, you know, it's the a private goes way. Up to the middle. It's a uh, private way, so all of it belongs, each part of it belongs to somebody in the private way. So is it a shared interest or is there a 
Sure, everybody sure has right-of-ways over everybody's right-of-ways. Now, you know, is there an obligation? The deeds are so old, you know, it doesn't say that you're obligated to make your right-of-way accessible to humans. Maybe cows used it then. So... Uh, but doesn't your right... Your right-of-way sometimes includes the right to maintain yeah. the rest of the Well, I, I, you know, I've considered it. No, that's a lot. No, it, it looks like there needs to be some vehicle for some community right. action yeah. that's, that has not formed on its own. And that, I think exactly. that's what you're looking for. Yeah. And uh, yeah. if we could have uh, some mentorship, some body to talk to, to create a forum. The people who are owners of property in the street are long-standing players in real estate. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I, a small potato. You know, we have a, a number of subdivisions in Northampton that have that are associations mm -hmm. that were formed to perform a specific function. And a lot of times, it's drainage and in its retention basins normally. But mm -hmm. I mean, that's a that's an avenue. I would think that these these abutters to the private way could form an association. But I think it gets back to you really need an attorney to help you form those steps. Sure. And all that you need from the city is the ability a, a permit to connect to our system. That's right. Yeah, I think that's the least of our problems. Right. I'm not sure what else we can do for you this evening. Um, Hardly, uh, I'm sure you're not pleasantly surprised by the outcome, um, but I'm not sure what else we can yeah, do with well, tonight. Enough, but, so, is there going to be regular plowing of Center Court this winter? If the City Council approves the appropriation for it, because I'm working off the Inspector General's rule, I need to go back to City Council and ensure that they appropriate the funds to plow the private ways while we deal with this messy matter. And it's our intention to ask them to approve. So it certainly that certainly has our blessing. That's what we are that's what we are asking for. The goal is to wrap it up prior to not this winter but the following winter. Have all the proper all the private ways addressed. That was the goal. So I don't know if this winter the city's that's a city council decision, not ours. Do you have any idea when the city council is taking that up? Like, can I don't you bring know. that to? I don't know. I need to speak with the acting mayor. We're still trying to untangle all of this. It's right. probably won't be right away. Right. I would try talking to your city councilor and your at-large city councilors to uh, get some information on that. One of your at-large city councilors, by the way, is your acting mayor. Is <laughs> what? I said one of the one of her at large city councilors is also her acting mayor, so <laughs> what ward is that, excuse me? Is it one? No, one A? One three. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Is it three? I don't know. I don't know. It's either one or three. Okay. All right, well so down the office in the morning and I'll tell you, I got it posted on the wall. There you go. You can go right on the <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we need to move along. Um, Anne Marie is here to talk to us. Did, uh, did most of you happen to see the, I think it was a philosophical uh, mm -hmm. complaint about the way the uh, new water and sewer rates were implemented. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure she wasn't really fighting yeah. over the four dollars. but. Um. If I talked to her staff, she was. Oh, she was? Okay. Well, anyway, Anne-Marie is here to uh, explain some of the issues there. Right. Um, so, first of all, I, I thought that the letter didn't sort of accurately portray the nature of uh, what I attempted to communicate at the time. Um, would, I you, never would you mind uh, relocating on the hallway? Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 
So um, I didn't prorate her bill because I can't prorate the bill. Yeah. Um, and I tried to communicate that. Um, when I was first made aware of the nature of her sort of reaction to her utility bill increase, I went onto the system and I looked at her consumption history. I thought initially, I assumed that the discrepancy was related to some kind of a consumption increase due to a water leak at that location. But when I looked at her consumption history, I saw that she was billed five billable units, which is relatively low and consistent with her billing history. So all I did was I took the five billable units and I calculated what it would cost at the FY11 rates versus what it would cost at the FY12 uh, rates. And I told her that her $4.35 increase was due to the rate change, which became effective on July 1st. Um, she then requested that the utility billing clerks or the utility billing system prorate all of the customers in the city that are um, affected by the rate change as of July 1st. Yeah. And I tried to explain that the way that the city bills, as you're probably all aware, we do quarterly billing, so every customer in the city gets four bills per year, and the, rates become, the rate change becomes effective as of July 1st. So even though her um, meter may have been read in July, there's no way for me to know because the meter is just a snapshot in time. I can't tell whether that consumption occurred in April, um, May, June, or July. I, I, you know, she could have been on vacation until July, and used five units in that month, we're just not set up to address that issue. Um, so she then requested that we update the utility billing system to address a, a proration attempt. Um, and then I tried to explain that we're using the MUNA system, um, which is the municipal information system throughout the city, and that utility billing component is just one module of the city's financial system, financial information system. And that the city has, at this point in time, and I'm not sure exactly how much of an investment has been made into Munis, but I know that it's quite significant. Um, not just the investment, but the upgrades and the annual maintenance. Um, it, it just wasn't a feasible uh, solution to try to extract the utility billing uh, software portion out of Munis. Um, but there is a solution, and we talked a little bit about this in-house. If we did monthly billing, uh, we could actually bill the entire city every month. Um, but there's a lot of changes that would need to occur. A lot of the software, um, the meters would have to be changed out. We would need new software. I talked with um, Dave Sparks, and he said that approximately one third of the city is currently equipped with radio retransmitters. So we'd need to install um, about 6,000 radio retransmitter transmitters at a purchase price of 720,000. That's not including the installation costs, but we could actually change out for 720 the entire <coughs> remainder of the city. Um, a vehicle, data collector, computer system, and mapping software would total about 80,000. Um, changing out the existing non-compatible meters would cost about 50,000. So for approximately 850,000 in hardware and software costs and not manpower or any of the actual installation that goes along with that, we could uh, change into a system that could read every meter in the city in one day, but then we would have to bill all of those accounts. And we currently do about 2,000 um, customer bills each month. We have two utility billing clerks that perform that job duty. And part of what they're doing is they're looking at variances that occur in consumption and they're calling customers if they see a variance and they're following up on leaks. They're doing a lot of customer service. Um, I talked to Charlene, who's been with the city for a while, and she's really familiar with utility billing. Um, and she said that she wasn't quite sure whether or not two clerks could handle 8,000 bills, um, but that certainly customer service would need to go away. They would just have to work, focus on getting those bills out the door each month. Um, and then Ned also sort of questioned the postage that would, there would be a postage increase associated with that. There would be increase in mailing costs. Um, we don't know whether the actual billing, folding, stuffing machines that we currently have can handle that volume, so there would be additional upgrades. So it's feasible. It's something that we can address, but it's not cheap, and um, it would have to be a priority within our capital plan, which, as you're all aware, is already um, resulting in the increase in the water rates that initially brought up the problem. 
I think Jim has a solution at hand. No, no solution, but did he also, did Dave also say it would take two and a half years to upgrade those readers? He said um, that actually if they, they put a focused effort, and he, he also said a focused effort with the cooperation of the residents, because sometimes people don't appreciate having their meters changed out or radio. Be able to get stuff. into the houses. Right. But he thought within six months, with a real focused effort, he thought that it could be done. I'm willing to take that back. <laughs> Do we have a lot of complaints about this? So on the basis of one complaint, we've done some Fair pretty research, substantial uh, research. Ned has a, we typically get between three and four, maybe five complaints each year about this. The fact that they got a bill in July or August, and in fact they had a month or two months of water at the old rate, and they wanted the money. And their sewer, too. We just have no way of doing it. The fact of going to monthly billing, the question, the very question is, do we need monthly billing because we're income starved? No. We're doing fine with quarterly billing. So that's the only hitch there is we just can't go read all these meters unless we want to do a billion dollar investment. But and there is a, the money flow aspect too that we talked with Susan about that, that, that there would be an increase in uh, cash flow to the city if we went to monthly billing. and. She thought that was a good subject for the financial management team to talk with the, um, George Zimmerman, the city treasurer, to see if that would give an additional incentive to maybe move to that kind of an effort. Um, but again, it's so, something that you would need to approve any uh, you know, additional effort being put into that at this point. Um. As, as I get this, the, the first group of people that get their <coughs> bills under the new rate, pay their previous three months, they, they thought they should have paid the old rate because they, they withdrew the water in April, May, and June, but they get their bill in July and they're paying the new rate. Is mm -hmm. that? Well, it's the people happening? who are billed in July, the people who are billed in August, and the people who are billed in September. So yeah, but August, August, they have one month, one month of the new. Can can we do a, a blended rate so that you know one month it's you know it I don't, I don't it's two two months of the old rate and one month of the new rate. We could just blended. We could if we did monthly readings. No, what if we? What if we stayed with quarterly, but the July, maybe the August, you don't think so? Well, because water use varies so much as well, I know, but it summer months. You'd have to make an estimate. No, because I, I because don't think the software is flexible enough to, but he's saying you apply a pro a rate. Different, a, a different pro rate each. A somewhat minimized uh, increase to the people who get their... Uh, invoice at the end of July. You're going to uh, ask larger how to use that rate No, increase. no, I'm not. I'm going to say if the old rate was um, $2 yeah. and the new rate's $3, mm -hmm. um, we, we blend it so that, that the first bills might go out at $2.33 and then the next month it would be $2.66 and then the next month it's 3 bucks. And you, That's you, monthly billing though. No, it isn't. You, no. But by quarter, still by quarter. But you'd still be overcharging the first person by about a dollar seventy-five. Well, <laughs> you could adjust the start so that that the, the people that get the I think you could make an adjustment if you wanted to. I don't even know if it's possible to change the rate with each each month. Is it worth it for a buck and a quarter? Not to me. <laughs> well, this is what, what kind of work would we be putting into it? I know. I think it's just math, mathematical. You just come up with a blended rate for that bill. I think it is. But would the software allow that? We would have to change the rates in the system each time that we bills. issued the bills. Um, but then for three months, actually, just two months. Well, they would have to be changed back because sales also occur on a daily basis. So right. when we have sales that are ongoing, there, someone would just have to be updating the rates in the system depending on whether they were billing the section or whether they were billing a final sale at any oh, point Oh, you mean time. property transfers. Mm -hmm. right. uh, the meters get read every day. They're not read on a monthly, but they're read every day. So that besides having a monthly thing, you'd be actually having a daily proration over that three to four month period. 
No. Everybody oh. that, that wants to lynch Parsons. <laughs> Straight up, guys up. After we solve the private ways, we'll work on that. I mean, we could look at, in, in the training module, we could take a look mm -hmm. at how complicated that might be as a means of trying to... I sense that there's not much enthusiasm for it amongst the board. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you read our mood yeah. exactly. There's so much yes. time into it, which I'm glad you're doing to respond to the public, but I agree with you. And Jay, it's a lot of time that you put into this. Right, but the, she was here for a, a, an extended period of time. She, she started with Steve Sedegren, and then she went to yeah. DJ, and then when they... I, I understand. I'm just saying, huh? you have fun. Had to get the big guns. Uh, I couldn't handle it either, obviously. <laughs> I did there, very there poorly. Some, some savings associated with this, the fact that you go out and read the city once a month in a vehicle. One day, it's done. Maybe two days at the most. It's just done. Rather than having a full-time meter reader and another maybe half a meter reader, constantly reading meters year-round. Didn't you mention, though, there's a need for another meter? There's a vehicle, there's maybe additional billing staff to do one, <laughs> yeah. please. Yeah. So does it weigh even itself out and the, and the net is still zero? Oh, so in that one day read, they're circling, two, they're two just, vehicles are circling? just driving across the city, just collecting all the data. Just one vehicle. One vehicle. One, one vehicle, vehicle with the equipment and stuff. God, help if it breaks down. Yeah. And, and wonder, once you tried to prorate this, just trying to think in my head, what would be the next complaint, the next set of complaints that would come in? Would there be ten more, rather than just the five that you have now, or I, you're going to be damned if you do and damned if you don't? I have to be honest. I wouldn't want a monthly water bill. Nor would I. And also, just then it's just one more thing. You got to make sure you pay that month, and then what if they don't pay it? Then they're delinquent. Then you have to file the fees. It just fourteen percent. Yeah, it's. Uh, the yeah. Well, Anne Marie, thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry, I, I think I created a, a no. bad situation. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you. All right. Contract for sodium carbonate uh, for the water treatment plant to Astro Chemicals. Thirty-six thousand four hundred. Second. Uh, last year's price was twenty-six point eight cents per pound. This year it's twenty-eight cents per pound. This is for pH adjustment of the outgoing water from the water treatment plant. This is an annual contract. Questions? All in favor of approving the contract? Aye. 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 Next is contract for water monitoring services to Brown and Caldwell in the amount of thirty, in the, basically forty thousand dollars. Move approval. Special. Um, Brown and Caldwell has been doing the work for us for a number of years. We did go out to bid on this. We had one other bid from. Environmental Compliance Services out of Agawam, Mass, for about $3,000 more. Uh, this is annual groundwater quality testing surrounding the landfill. How long are Mandated we going by the state. How long are we going to be with that? After closure, 30 years. 30 years. Okay. Can you explain what you just said, asked? What's that? What, what did you just ask? How long we're going to be with that testing program. Oh, okay. After the landfill closed. 30 years after the closure. Oh, well, Post-closure monitoring regulations require 30 years. The state can reduce the program yeah. if you're not seeing you know, certain things in the groundwater flows, contaminants, so on. They can reduce the program, but we have to fund that in advance as we know it today mm -hmm. as we go to closure. Yeah. And they increase it? They could increase it if they felt that there was a need. But is this for 30 years? Is it more? No, no just this, one year. This is a year. This is one year. year. This is one year. <laughs> what a deal, 30 years of water. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's for one-thirtieth of 30 years. No, no, no. That's just a small yeah. 40, 40, 40 grand a year. We just could raise the rate. All right, so all in favor of approving this contract. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, contract for leachate treatment plant decommissioning to Wright Pierce in one hundred and six thousand dollars um, as part of the closure of landfill, we need to look at decommissioning of the leachate treatment plant. Uh, the plant was built uh, part of the requirement of the state when the first line cell was built uh, to deal with heavy metals that they thought that we were going to have, which never occurred. We stopped operating the plant approximately 12 or 13 years ago, and it's been dormant ever since. Basically, it's filled with process machinery and equipment. There's two leachate lagoons down there that serve for aeration basins. Those are being abandoned as part of this project. 
Currently, the leachate is gravity fed into a wet well pumped out to Ryan Road, where it goes gravity into the system and ends up in the wastewater treatment plant for treatment. Uh, so, as part of closure, we're looking to, I shouldn't say mothball the facility, but there's no need for the process equipment to be in there. The city is looking at perhaps using this as citywide archive space in the future. It is a large, very large Morton style building down there. Uh, there is small office space and bathroom facilities also. So we're working with the ESCO on this also, which is our energy service contract with the city, about how to bring in energy saving to that facility. And one of them is to basically uh, mothball it, put it into cold storage, except for the necessary office spaces that might be used on occasion. Uh, you could turn on a propane heater. So looking at getting rid of the 5,000 gallon oil tank that's in the ground, the backup generator system that services the whole facility when all we need is a small gen set to service the wet well pumps and the pump station, uh, things of that nature. So it's a pretty exhaustive RFP. You were all emailed it in advance. Um, Jim couldn't make it tonight. Uh, he knows the most about this project. I'll try to answer all your questions. David? This is for engineering of the this, shutdown. It's not for the work. It is engineering design services and construction management services. What we would do is put together a bid package. They would go out to bid. They would look at salvaging whatever material they can out of the plant, resell it, auction it, try to make some money back off of it, and then the construction work associated with decommissioning the building itself as far as, um, you know, taking the heating system, uh, draining it down, so it could be utilized in the future, but, you know, making sure that the facility is secure and can go into cold storage, also taking the lagoons offline that are no longer necessary. <coughs> so there'll be a construction contract at the end of this also. Any idea what that might be? We've estimated about $500,000 for the work total. Were there any other uh, bidders on this project? <coughs> it was a uh, design RFP selection, so we set the fee at $120,000. We actually uh, whittled it down to one firm that we wanted to work with, which was AECOM. Their proposal came back at $145,000. We told them that was unacceptable. Uh, they came back down at $140,000. 20, I believe it was, or 118, but there was a substantial reduction in the scope of services and the service that we felt were critical to make this project move forward. So with that, we went to the next lowest, uh, next not lowest, but most uh, responsive bidder, which is Wright Pierce. And we negotiated this price with a reduced multiplier for profit and overhead. So what was the criteria, what kind of criteria did White Right, Pierce fail at that made it your second choice. I wish Jim was here to tell oh, you that exact answer. Sorry. Yeah, they weren't as comprehensive as as the other guy on their on their overall plan. I think. Edicom had apparently previously done some work. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually did the decommissioning report, which was used for the basis for this RFP to get the work done. So they were involved early on with this of looking, you know, producing the, the final report for decommissioning and suggestions what we should do and how to go about doing that. So the the work product from this bid, from this contract, will be all of the, the bid documents we need, all of the construction designs, mm -hmm. a lot of blueprints or specifications, yep. and construction management and inspection. Yes. Oh, so I I took the opportunity to review this with David Valletta, who actually spearheaded the effort, right? Yes. With Jim. And um, I, I think one comment, there is no continuous on-site inspection. There are periodic visits. That makes sense, I think, for this kind of work because okay. you can see what's done. You don't need to watch it happen all the time. And I, I had a few questions, and I went through it, and I thought he did a great job. Um, and the price for the work seems typical of the industry to me, so I, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. I just yeah. wanted to know when, uh, when it was built, when the building was built. It was built for the first line cell, so it was built for 1990 when that facility went online. 
I don't know if construction started a year or two prior. The first line landfill. Right. First line cell, which I believe was went yeah. online in 1990. Mm -hmm. Gee. Yeah. Um, you might have answered it. I missed it. The funds for this will come from? Southwest Enterprise. So it's all part of the post-closure? It is. It is. It is part of the closure fund. Okay. Thank you. Uh, people feel comfortable voting? Yeah. All in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 <coughs> All right. Uh, next change order number two to contract 351.11 to Gomes Construction from Street. I forgot to put the amount of money in there. Let's right here. 10660. Oh, oh, you did on the Gomes. Uh, uh -huh. I'll deal with the next meeting. Oh, it's on there. <laughs> It's on the change already. Yes, it is. Tell them how much. Six thousand four hundred ninety-seven dollars and forty cents. Second. Tell us more. Um, basically, with the reconstruction of Con Street, we've narrowed the travel lanes and narrowed the apparent width of it also by a couple feet. Uh, one thing that's lacking down there is uh, no on-street parking. So we're working with the ordinance committee to go through and look at no parking on both sides of Con Street, basically the entire length of that. This is Gomes's price to purchase and erect all these no parking signs along that corridor. Would they be set? It's, it's kind of weird that the phone poles stick out of the concrete sidewalk. Would these be on the lawn next to the sidewalk? They would be up just off the edge, according to just the back side of a the sidewalks. Very It does. I'm very, I'm, I'm happy with it. Very reasonable. Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, okay, discussion House Bill 255 and Senate Bill 349 relative to water resources. This is the handout you received at your last board meeting that we asked for you to review that we might um, actually approve or make subtle changes to the language in the letter if you choose to do so. So it's really up to the board what they want to do with this. As you call, this is about um, uh, water water management rights and who's going to get the water, uh, whether it's the water suppliers or uh, releases to the streams. So the issue is, should we be required to release water from our drinking water reservoirs if we think a stream should be higher for optimal stream health? Right. That wouldn't be our decision. The way it's, the way this proposed legislation is written is the Fish and Wildlife Service yeah. will make that determination, and they'll do it within one year of enactment of this bill. And they would establish the steam, stream flows that would have to happen year-round. Uh, our concern, obviously, from the last one we talked about is a drought such as we had in 2002 or even uh, last year uh, and to continue to feed these streams that we historically haven't fed um, just kind of took us by surprise that it felt like this was moving forward. I, I would assume that all the public water supply facilities throughout the state are opposed to this. I don't know how many are. I don't know how many have written letters in response. Uh, this was a coordinated approach to the Massachusetts uh, Water uh, Works Association. Excuse me. American Water Works Association. Too many acronyms in my life. I'm sorry. I'm <coughs> sending it. <laughs> The guy who works for me wants to pick out uh, you know, uh, <laughs> but, uh, all right, I'm sorry. Uh, is, 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 uh, is not, uh, there were a group of people meeting on this and, and uh, uh, have been meeting for quite a while. There's and been a group of water suppliers who have been meeting on this for probably close to two years on this and uh, the bill is moving forward, uh, apparently falling on some deaf ears. I think um, most of the water suppliers across the state are probably against this, as that they were formed to, you know, collect the water from these watershed areas for human consumption. And it's my understanding that Peter Kokut has signed on to this bill That's correct. to support it. Uh, should we invite him into a meeting and uh, 
talk to them about how we feel about this. We I can mean, do that. I think it's what I think. We absolutely should. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Well, you might give us some insight as to whether the letter is appropriate or whether it would help. Mm -hmm. or do we know why he took on the responsibility for sponsoring this? I don't know. It looked like a good idea. Well, you know. Yeah, Peter, and Peter, Peter is a uh, fish and wildlife person. I must yeah. say that. I had a time. fish story. Yeah. yeah. There's also a Senate bill <laughs> moving forward in conjunction with this also, so we need to have the same conversation with uh, Senator Rosenberg. Oh, the Senate bill, uh, uh, is that the one that limits the increase to two and a half percent? I think that's a that's a petition. That's a separate one. That's a petition. Oh, but that's right. That's a, that's a petition that's going to go on the ballot. I think they have enough signatures. I sent you an email the other day. Yeah. I believe they have the signatures necessary. It's a matter of how they move it forward. Yeah. So, so how about that idea of inviting? I think uh, you should. Do you yes. want to invite Senator Rosenberg also? Sure, why not? Yeah. Right. Get them both in here. We could uh, we could serve some bottled water <laughs> from our reservoir. <laughs> well, you could. Does that seem uh, sufficient for the moment? Sure. Okay. Um, and then SWAC would like to give us an update. Me do the update? Sure. Okay. Um, we are, did a re, uh, press release back in August and invited the community to express interest in getting involved. And we've got a number of people who have sent in um, applications to be on the committee. Uh, we uh, convened last Wednesday morning and went and toured the Valley Recycling Site on our Route 10. Uh, this Saturday we have the Reuse Fair, which is a, a, originally started as the Rigid Plastic a collection but it's expanded so we'll be collecting bikes and textiles. So the idea was to try to start these intermittent reuse events until we get... Bicycles or big wheels? Bicycles. We <coughs> yeah, bikes, not... Some, I think it's called bikes, not bobs, that, uh, yep. that yep. collects the... the yep. that will come and collect the bikes okay. and reuses them. Um, so the idea is to start gathering the entities that do collections anyways into one spot and make it a community fair. So we're doing that. And then a meeting again next Wednesday morning to, uh, we're actually going to take a tour of the Mass Highway site next Wednesday morning and then convene with our dream proposal of what a reuse center might look like. So that's our meeting. And, and Ned, I was thinking, I was, when you were talking about this the other day, I was thinking about the building next door. Is it... Clearly, it's it's not appropriate to, for some kind of a major facility or even a, a, a facility that's heavily used. But is it safe? I mean, if someone went in there, are there is there a danger of the roof falling in on no. them? Or? No. So just as a as an alternative to an open shed for some the swap stuff. The building is in a state of disrepair. Uh, they haven't done any work on it in a very long time. We had a consultant's report done six years ago in the facility, and their recommendation was demolition of the building. Which, which building? The state yard next door. Oh, see, I was thinking about, for example, Wellesley has a, what I think many people consider a really fabulous drop-off, pick-up, take it, use it, sort of a deal. And they're just open. It's so good, they charge admission. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> quite amazing. So. It's, but they're just open sheds, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking the building next door at least would be, I mean, we're ahead of the game. Well, we've got a group of excited people who are looking to explore possibilities. And I think that we don't need cool. heat, we don't need utilities, we don't need bathrooms. We need light. We need ownership first. Yeah. <laughs> Jim? There is a concrete floor that is suspended by timbers, is held up by timbers, and the timbers are absolutely rotten to beat the band. It I would be very, I would think very carefully before I allowed anybody to actually go in that building. They, ah. they turned off the power and let the sump pumps not work and filled the basement with water and caused that damage. Ah, well, that's how that is it. Another state hospital. So they did the same thing with that property, just shut it off. So this thing is a basement 
with a concrete floor, a wood frame concrete floor. Yeah. Timbers. Could that be considered a uh, capped landfill if we were to pack all of the <laughs> dirty yeah. stuff in the backyard and put it in the basement? I don't think so. No. <laughs> are you going to carry it in? No. <laughs> you, you'd hire somebody smarter than me. But we are working on the release deed for next door for the whole city taking ownership. And it, is it our impression that the state's ready to move forward? Absolutely. Okay. So this could happen this year? Um, it could. Uh, of course, we said that last year at this time. Well, well, our payment to them is a uh, salt shed? We were going to salt Our, <laughs> right our payment to them is a little <laughs> odd in structure is that they had their appraisals done, and the appraisals came up to X amount of dollars, and then they started discounting the liabilities on the site yeah. to get that down to zero. So basically, the $150,000 for the salt shed was part of that cost. Uh -huh. The demolition of the existing building was part of that cost. The capping of their solid waste landfill, if that's what you want to call it, <coughs> had a cost to it. And basically it came to zero. So the transfer of land becomes it comes at a zero cost but with liabilities to the city. Okay. Excuse me, is this something that has to be approved by city council? I don't believe so. I believe it gets approved by the Board of Works <coughs> and the Mayor would be the approval process. And then the appropriations that will have to be done to actually invest the money to do all these things, who does that? Who makes that? It all depends on what the end use of the facility is. It's for a transfer station. I assume it would be the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. If it becomes part of the DPW facility. I assume there'll be expenditures of uh, water, sewer enterprise, solid waste enterprise, and general fund. It could be anything. The, the property comes to us for unrestricted, but for any municipal use. And and this would, but it's still, then that money would have to be voted on by the city, city council if you're going to appropriate it for that's, those things. That's correct. And would this be something that the acting mayor could sign off on? Or does it, like, I'm just curious. I don't, I don't city I, council for money. Well, no, no, I guess I mean the purchase of this land. If, it, if, they, if you make this agreement, to, if the Board of Public Works says we want this and the mayor signs off on it, is that something that David Narcos would be doing? I don't know. You'd have to ask that to come to our, our city solicitor okay. whether he has that authority. The acting mayor has all the powers of a real mayor, full-time elected mayor. She's issued this. Uh, yeah, but that's only two months away. It's yeah. just like Without the salary. Yeah. Four months. The important, right. the important thing about this building is that the, the, the land next door, I think you have to look at it in uh, Board of Public Works years. Um, over the, we have to think in generations. Mm -hmm. When we do uh, large waterworks projects, our children's children will be using this stuff. The, the barn next door was built when Grant was president. Uh, the, the point is that we're essentially getting something for free that is valuable property adjacent to property that we already have. To me, but there's still a liability tied to yeah. it that the elected officials will eventually be responsible for, and yet they're not making the decision whether or not to move forward with it. That's my question. So if it's if it's an if it's appointed people who are not elected, and and the mayor who's going to sign off on it, who is elected, but I'm saying that eventually the city council will be the ones responsible for appropriating any funds to fix that land or and do anything with that land. So, but they're but not part of the process. meanwhile, it sits there for free. But it's not free, though, because you are going to have to invest money to cap, play, pay for that land. But that's coming from the solid waste enterprise. <laughs> but if a private industry, such as, uh, I think, was it Round Hill, where let, you know, that, that area had to be cleaned up, even if their land was going to be taken, they're being told they have to clean it up. I'm just curious. Apparently, it's street sweeping. You know, those machines go back and dump the stuff. And all indications are there's nothing there. <laughs> oh, no, but either way, it's still... Eventually a excellent basement to build. Yeah. Eventually a liability though. Even if it is a nice piece of land. I, I just I'm curious about the process. I'm always interested in process, so that's my thing. I'm not saying anything's right or wrong. It's just a matter of process. <laughs> Sounds like a campaign issue. That's not my even a campaign issue. The process. Okay. It could be flawed. Okay. Um, all right. Anything Gary if you like to talk about? No? Jim? Oh, all set. Oh, whoa. Oh. Second thoughts. No 
readers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I read that uh, Hampshire and Hamden counties, or was it? Was yeah. Hampshire and Hampton, was mm -hmm. added to the list of Irene eligible yep. female oh. money. And I noticed that somebody had started to do some cleaning up at Mains Field recently. And I'm wondering if. We're tracking all labor, equipment, yeah. materials associated with Hurricane Irene. It's my understanding, well, we're going to a meeting on September 20th at Hatfield Town Hall where they're going to lay out the process and what is reimbursable at 75% and what is not. Yeah. It's like previous storms, overtime is qualified, <coughs> equipment used in overtime is qualified, <coughs> and any direct costs of fixing damage like mains field. Last time, uh, in 2007, we spent about $50,000 repairing Mainsfield. Field. Right. That looked like it might have been worse this time. Um, I don't think so. No? Was the, there was a sinkhole just to the right of home plate. What was that all about? Just getting rid of home plate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the knuckle ball goes. Yeah. I don't know what water pattern happened to the house, <laughs> but it's probably four or five feet <laughs> just like this yeah. huge cavern at yeah. home plate. I took pictures of it when the, the, pic, the top of the picnic table was even with uh, the water. That's where mm -hmm. it's sort of it's out across that field. Well, I wonder if, if it was maybe something. So, you know, there's other city damage, like almost all the channel markers in the Connecticut River were lost. Yeah. Uh, minus <coughs> 60,000 to replace those. And it's us? No. Okay. Uh, planning department. Uh, there's overtime from fire, overtime from police, other city departments also, central services. Uh, we incurred almost $17,000 in overtime just in that weekend in the DPW. How did River Road survive? How well? River Road did okay. We've done some minor repairs out there to some berming. Um, it came probably within a foot and a half of coming over the road down by the overlook. Uh, you could stand out there, you could hear the boulders just rumbling down the river. But there wasn't amazing. a lot of scour. There was scour of the localized banks, but um, our retaining walls did hold up. We didn't see any further settlement of it, but um, the river moved a lot of things around there. Cleaned a lot of logs out of the river. <laughs> what was the actual elevation when it crossed the road at uh, uh, Route 5? Yeah. Route 5? Connecticut River went to 117.6, I believe it was. 117.4. Anybody check the actual elevation when it went over the road? I don't believe so. I still say that road was raised three, four inches, five inches. They repaved it. Yeah. Three inches. I don't know what the state did down there. <laughs> it makes a difference, doesn't it? Yes. The newspaper article said, I believe, it to the city, the, the, the stormwater was uh, 12 inches higher than the last record, which I guess was 07. It was 07. And where would and so where was that measurement taken from? Clement Street. Oh, it was so the <coughs> Clement Street USGS gauging station. Gauging station. Okay. Huh? All right. Well, just for the record, for the fun of it, in Hurricane Floyd, there was eight inches of water in the boathouse at uh, Smith College in Paradise Pond, and I believe 2007 was the same. But I did measure it this time, and it was 20 inches, so it was actually 12 inches difference. Higher. And at that point, is it higher than the dam? No. Higher, what's that? Is it the boathouse is by the pond? Well, it's by the pond, and there yeah. was 20 inches of water. The high water mark, this clear line, 20 but inches. But if, if you extend that over horizontally, at that point, is it higher than the dam? Uh, is there so much water going over the dam? Yeah. Oh, it's five, it's over five feet. If you, it depends on where you measure, but the, the actual spillway is something like 134. And the floor of the boathouse is? I don't know, but I can tell you that the water hit right around 140. So it was six, six feet. feet of water going over the spillway. Now the flashboards were still there, so it's really roughly four feet, mm -hmm. a little more than four feet going over the spillway, uh, the top of the flashboards. And they didn't fail. They, there's holes punched in them, there's chunks missing. But wow. Right now, it's, we're below normal pool because the, the water that we have is passing through the flashboards and not going over them. We really lucked out with this storm. I think you know, we, we did. were predicting five to ten, and we only got four point two locally. Yes. And if we had gotten that, um, I think the city would have been hit very hard. Uh, DPW is scrambling, trying to. I mean, we've got the wall up on West Street. 
we're getting ready to start looking at putting out the walls on Route 5, but you know, the Connecticut River is just it's a long range right. flood that you can watch it, you can react a little bit slower on it. But, uh, and then the following Monday, we had that deluge of rain where the Mill River rose at two and a half feet in a half an hour. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sunday, I drove from St. Albans, Vermont to Pittsfield on Route 7, mm -hmm. all the way down Route 9 into Williamsburg and up over South Street mm -hmm. and down Sylvester Road. The next morning, I opened up the paper. And I got two of the bridges that I drove over on seven washed out. The covered bridge that you saw floating down the river there, I went by that while it was still standing. And I just couldn't believe my son was calling me every hour on the hour saying, Dad, get off of the road. I said, it's not raining hard. And it wasn't. <laughs> it was not raining that hard. Yet what happened was, the storm went up into New York State, went around the back of Champlain that came in behind us and followed us down. Did you Drove check your rearview mirror and see a wall of water coming in? <laughs> <laughs> I was very, very fortunate. Yeah. Nancy and I went to 8 o'clock Mass, and at 9 o'clock we left St. Albans. So it's good Good thing we mass. went to church. <laughs> uh, so, Mike, we asked you if you were... Uh, and our new member, Gene? Over no, I went. Uh, I took an air conditioner off the bike path uh, up in Leeds, up at Beaver Brook uh, Estates uh, last week, and I took another one at our tree meeting out of the uh, field. We picked it up today. Did you? I, I dragged it out. On the side of the road. Yeah, mm -hmm. I dragged it out. So people are starting to throw appliances out yeah, in areas here. And I've taken mattresses off of the bike path in Leeds also. So... And maybe that goes along with the flood because the Realtors Association said this morning that 42, or excuse me, 25 percent of all the mortgages in Western Massachusetts are underwater. 25 percent. 25 percent. Wow. People have literally 25 percent. They owe more on their house than they're worth. Wow. So and there, there, there's a lot of nerves now about people walking away from these mortgages. And they're gone. Or at least walk away from their air conditioning. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Ned, anything that we didn't cover? The most exciting part was Hurricane Irene. Yeah. yeah. It um, definitely threw us a good challenge. And you did well. I think yeah, we did. I, 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 yeah. And you're, you're uh, our, the boards yeah. across uh, Route 66 and yeah. the, those dry runs, if you will. I suppose you fired up the pumps at all. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. Everything right. seems fine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and very proud of the crew that showed up on Saturday and put that up. Uh, even though we did inconvenience a few people, um, it went fine. In fact, the underneath the bridge at West Street, there's a set of arches, and once it hits the arches, it's going to start the backwater very quickly upstream. And it actually, the arches were underwater, and everything started to go back down, and we were getting quite concerned at that point. It was amazing. Sunday, there was no high water in the Connecticut River. It hadn't gone into flood state yet. It was 105 and a half, 106 Sunday when the mill was right. way up. It took what two days for it to come up. Yeah. Monday or Tuesday it came up, and all that water came from the mill. River was already all down. Yeah. yeah. By the way, you can see uh, Northampton Media did a story and photographs on the putting up of the um, floodgate on. Yeah. Route 66 and uh, and of the Mill River that and the Connecticut, but uh, mainly the Mill River on Sunday, mm. which was uh, was a picture of Ned and Jim standing there looking at the arches, which are completely filled at the West Street Bridge. Yeah, uh, I don't think the water ever got up to the no, to the gate. You put That's a high sky. It didn't. It didn't come out. It was of the about a foot and a half, two feet shy of the flood control walls. But the cops kept kicking us off the bridge. It was they higher than 55. They weren't sure it was going to last. Heard. It was higher in 55. And in 38. And, and I was six, there, but I was there in 55. <laughs> um, all right, BJ, all set? All set. Thanks, you do. All set. All set. I'm fine. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. The Upper Roberts Meadow Dam, speaking of all this lovely Hurricane Irene, what's the status update on what's happening there? The DCR sent out uh, emergency teams to all high-hazard dams in the Commonwealth 
for inspections immediately after the storm. And they inspected uh, six of our dams. And from my understanding, we haven't seen a written report, but verbally they said that the dams are in okay shape still. And where, what is the status on the dismantling of the dam? Uh, we are awaiting a uh, recommendation for, from FEMA for funding at this point. It's under the federal review. Okay. Thank the you. state has passed it up to the federal review at this point. It's still standing. It looks very sturdy. Good. <laughs> they always look really sturdy. Our guys, I think they are done. Our work here is kind of water. there at the height of the story. Really? Motion to approve? Adjourn. 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 Adjour